And it's three o'clock in Boston, Massachusetts. So we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, my name is Allison Posey. I'm a learning design and research specialist here at CAST. We are located, well, I am located just outside of Boston and CAST is um, more of a remote, uh, is a remote uh, organization today. And, um, and so we are located all over the country. So it's very exciting to be here with you all today. And I, as I'm thrilled to be here, um, getting to share about Upskill, Reskill, and Thrive. And before we begin, I want to invite you all to think of a time you had professional learning. So maybe it was onboarding for a new job or the current job that you have currently. Maybe it was a continued learning opportunity where you had to go to a training somewhere to hone your skills at work. Or maybe, I was thinking, maybe this webinar is a form of professional learning for you. Uh, whatever this professional learning event is, today we have author James McKenna, who is here and is going to share with us about his new book. And I love the title. We'll talk about it in a moment. Upskill, Reskill, Thrive optimizing learning and development in the workplace. And he has thoughtfully, with so many concrete examples and strategies, shared how universal design for learning, UDL, can be applied across industries to optimize productive and meaningful learning. I'm really excited for this conversation today. But before we begin, I do wanna make sure we invite you all to participate and contribute to the conversation. So you can open the chat panel from the webinar controls. Many of you have already done that and have already started introducing yourselves and where you're from. Please choose everyone from the breakdown uh, or from the drop down above where you type so you can add your questions into the Q&A pop up or you can get started asking your questions or contributing uh, asynchronously in that chat area at any time. So you don't have to wait for a specific time. You can start putting in ideas and thoughts and questions right away. And if you're participating uh, with us listen, by listening to the recording, we want to welcome you as well. And whether you're attending now or later, please also um, contribute and share through Twitter. You can use the handles at cast underscore UDL. Those are all capitalized. Or you can use at James McKenna, all lowercase or you can use hashtag CASTPL, all capital letters. So we do invite you to participate either in the chat or through Twitter at any point during the conversation. I wanna thank our captioner for being here. Angus, thank you so much for being here. And then we invite you if it's helpful to please turn on your captions um, by clicking on, by enabling um, the closed captions feature in your Zoom. So we also would like to let you know about our digital handout. So the digital handout is a place where we have made information from the webinar available and you'll find an outline of, dis of the discussion topics. You can access the links to resources from James and from the work across CAST and CAST, CAST Professional Publishing. So we do invite you to go there and we will make that an interactive um, uh, digital handout. If there are links or pieces to the conversation we have today that we want to add to that, that will be a place for us to be able to co-construct resources um, from the conversation we have today. So unless there are any questions about those logistics, I want to get to the good stuff. James, I'm honored to have you with us today. James has had so many unique experiences in his life. He's been a special education teacher, a musician, a member of the United States Navy, and currently he's the Assistant Director of Professional Learning and Leadership Development for the California Collaborative for Educational Excellence. He's an award-winning educator, and we're so proud to now call him a cast author. James, welcome. So happy to have you here. Oh, I'm, I'm just thrilled to be here. Yes, and so before we even begin and jump in, I kind of said to everyone at the beginning that I love the title of your book, uh, this, this Upskill, Reskill, and Thrive. So before we even dig into the meat of our conversation, I wanted to invite you to let us know what you mean by each of these words, because they're really strong, active sounding words. Well, if we think about Starting with the end in mind, we want to thrive, right? And we want to be our best selves at work and in life, right? And well, what is that going to take? Well, we need to be able to, we need to be able to not only get along socially, but we need to meet our needs, but we need to be able to continuously grow and improve, moving up that Maslow's hierarchy towards actualization. That's thriving. Well, 
when the OECD tells us, or the Organization for Economic and anyway. Well, I'm glad you are trying basically, to define those acronyms. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, the report came out not too long ago that over a billion jobs are going to change in the next five years, which means work, and it's probably not a stranger to anybody on this webinar, work continuously to looks different. And so we have to be able to skill, which is thinking about how we can do our current jobs better, faster, more efficiently, more effectively. Um, a reskill, get ready to do new jobs, right? Because the era of the 40 year career in one job is, is largely over for most folks. And so if we wanna thrive, that means we have to be able to continuously grow and improve in ways that make us you know, uh, have worth for ourselves and worth for our organizations. And so that's what this is all about, is how do we continuously grow and improve and within our organizations, create a culture and a climate and systems that allow people to become their best selves at work. Ah, I love it. This is good stuff before we even rolled our sleeves up to get into the meat of what we're talking about today. That's fantastic. Upskill, reskill, thrive. This is fantastic. So I do want to ask, it just... A, a book is a lot of work. So why did you write this book? What inspired you to write this book? Um, back in 2015, I was transitioning from become from being a, uh, a school administrator, working with special ed programs in the field, to working in a central office where my job would now be to support teachers and, and principals. And the first uh, assignment I got was create a blended learning uh, course for our teachers around universal design for learning. I had seen UDL in my two teacher credentialing programs for probably a total of an hour. And it was like, here's a chart, there's lots of colors, all these bullets, and nobody could really tell much about it. And it just sort of, it was just a thing amidst another two and a half hour lecture. Mm -hmm. But at this point, when it got reintroduced to me, I had just spent three years uh, in a doctoral program learning about the science of how we learn and what motivates us. And when I looked at the guidelines, I said, well, this is all the stuff I just spent three years learning about. And I could, you know, think about all the different things that were cognitive load theory and stuff, but it's, it, I saw it, well, this is a great way to take all these sometimes really esoteric and, and clunky things and put them into practice. And then I said, well, if we're supposed to help students learn in this way, but this research is not just based on how kids learn, it's about how people learn and are motivated. So how do I start to universally design the professional learning that I'm going to provide so it adds value, it's more effective, it models it for, te for the teachers. And so that began my road and started looking around at, well, there's this greater world of learning and development that I didn't really know about. I didn't think about learning besides formal school and training. It should have should have been more obvious to me, having been in, in the U.S. Navy, which the U.S. military is the biggest educational organization in the world. They train more people than anybody. And so really thinking about, wait, why do people do this? And how are they talking about making things more flexible, more supportive, applying this research. Uh, and at the time I was still seeing things around learning styles. I was attending uh, professional learning, which sometimes was fantastically facilitated and sometimes was, okay, folks, we're gonna drink from the fire hose. And then 200 slides later, nobody wants to be in the room and I don't remember what happened. Well, we've got to do better than this. So that, that led to me uh, talking to David Gordon at CAS about, hey, I've got this, this idea. And, uh, you know, four and a half, five years later, we have a book. Amazing. But you really wanted people to learn. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I Everyone, think it, all learners, even adults. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> it says on the slide there, I think there's this time, this bifurcation where like, well, learning and then work. I like to say work is learning and learning is work. So a lot of work, especially that that's not say algorithmic and or like a factory line or something like that. It's it's solving problems. It's figuring out ways to do new things. It's 
It's figuring out how to deal with other people and how to build consensus. There's a lot of learning that happens. It's gathering new information, trying to find out how to do things better, uh, how to invent the better mousetrap, I guess. And so learning is inextricably tied to work. We do a lot of that. It's not separate. Yes, we may do some separate learning, that is, so, but that's supposed to translate into us doing better on our jobs. But learning is work. And so it it's in, it has to be intentional. You have to think about how learning happens and how people learn from each other and how we make learning valuable and what do we incentivize. It's, it's not just going to happen on accident, or at least it's not going to happen well on accident, right? And one thing we know about, if we support people to learn and they feel like they're invested in their development, they'll stay. They're, they're like, this place is loyal to me. Retention goes up. And it's a lot harder to hire new people than it is to develop your own people. It's more expensive. And, and still, they, they're they not likely to stay unless they really feel you're invested in their growth. So it's, it's really about seeing that relationship between learning and organizational success, individual team and organizational success, and the intentionality that you have to have to make that happen. Amazing. And... In thinking about that, it makes me think of all the different layers where the learning can happen. And if this is happening in the workplace and then it's being modeled by the trainings you're having in the workplace, the power for that to then transcend lots of different places, lots of different environments to really, as you're saying, develop this expert learning uh, that will really make the environments robust, more productive, more engaging, and places where people want to continue their learning and their growth. So um, I know that there's an example here about how um, how you came to some of this, um, this way of thinking personally, that again, shows how this idea of universal design for learning extends beyond a formal learning or even a formal work environment, but really got to, to your heart and, um, and, and really inspired some of this work. So I'm hoping you can share some of that with us here. Yeah, this was, you know, um, a story you know, we think about in, in universal design for learning circles, we talk a lot about firm goals and flexible means, uh, allowing for people to have the autonomy and the empowerment to work to their to their strengths and leverage their interests and figure out the best way with support and guidance to meet the high expectations we have for folks. Well, this is Janine. And this picture was taken uh, when she graduated with her master's degree in school counseling. And that was in 2009 when the economy was really uh, taking a beating and suddenly there, were no, there weren't a lot of counselor jobs. Counselors were getting laid off. So rather than becoming a school counselor immediately, they went to become an enrollment advisor at a for-profit university. And she thought her job was to be like, like counseling, but really what it was, it was a sales job. Here, here, are, here are a bunch of leads, all these people. And at one point, you know, she'd been on the job for six, eight months and she was doing fine. And But she started to hit her stride and say, you know, if I really apply my counseling lens and listen to folks and talk to them about what they want and take a genuine interest like I would in counseling, I can make a good suggestion for them, even if we're not the right program, maybe I can direct them somewhere else. And that's, and her her enrollments were going up. But at the same time, the powers that be came out with this process. They said, well, it's purely by the number of calls. They wanted to sort of people proof by making a process that everybody would have to do. If you make this many calls, this many per percent would turn into enrollment and our numbers will go up. And the rest of the team was using that. She wouldn't. She kept doing these her way. And over time, they started, well, you're really not using the process, but I'm enrolling more people than anybody else. You're not using the process. It's getting harassing. There's emotional barriers to performance that were starting to come in, right? There was limits on autonomy, right? And so it came to a head when it was time to give the, uh, give the yearly award for the highest performer. And she was called into her manager's office and was told, um, you're the highest performer, but I can't give you the award because you're not using the profit, the process and the corporate folks are here 
and they can't see they can't see me give it to the person that doesn't do the process and she said okay i quit yeah and then she called me because she's my wife and she said honey we were we were trying to buy a house and she's like honey i just quit my job and we had to figure it out and what was funny was this, this online this university really modeled itself after another university that was bigger in the space. And what was funny was about six months later, it came out that the bigger university that they wanted to be like was espousing a process where you talked to the people more and you listened and you've tried to just match them with a better program than just But if we look at that, you say, well, we're, we're, we put in emotional barriers to learning. We had problems with, uh, not valuing the the individuality of the folks. And we really, what was the point? Was the point the process or was the point to enroll more people? We mm -hmm. lost sight of it because they wanted to do a one size fits all. And so I really thought about that. And we talked about it as a sort of UDL related thing. And that led to me thinking about professional learning and getting out of the silo of, well, let's just think about a webinar or a uh, uh, a in-person uh, training and think about how does this apply to the ways that we operate at work? And that was sort of seminal in, in expanding that thinking. It's such a helpful example, uh, James, because it really, and, and you asked this question, and I, I just want to emphasize it because I think it's a really important one. And that is, was their goal for people to make a certain number of calls or was their goal to build the relationships? And it seemed like they were rewarding just making the number of calls. And that's not in fact what they were valuing, but they actually, through what they were emphasizing with your wife, that seemed to be what their focus was. It's like they kind of missed, they were mm -hmm. conflating, I guess, those means or the how everyone could do it with what the real goal was. And, and they were almost missing sight of how strong her performance was. And they, they missed her the then. Yeah, they took the why all out of it and they staked their own egos on the success of this process instead of allowing for multiple paths to lead to success which is ultimately, that's what drives your business. That's what drives your organization is being, uh, what were the outcomes? Okay. Yeah, and the humans, the humans that are behind that. And I wanna share a quote from your book um, that I really think um, does a great job capturing some of what the story describes. And that's that we're addressing barriers and environments, not in people. So instead of focusing on, you know, you're not doing the, the calls in the right way, uh, you're shifting to think about what could be barriers in the process that makes people, um, that challenge people to be able to get to those performance goals that are there. And really thinking about um, asking people what they need in order to get to those goals. Because it sounds like the skills and the strengths that your wife had, that not everyone would have, there's variability there, we know that, but her strengths were not able to be leveraged in a way that contributed to the organization? And what if we really could each bring our strengths to really support the purpose or the goals? I, yeah. very and if someone doesn't about. have the, uh, someone doesn't have the empathy or the, the soft skill set to operate in the way she does, they have this other process. And then I'm sure there are other pathways to success. So it was, it was, they didn't all have to do it the Janine way. But Really, yeah, what you're talking about, yeah, the barriers exist in the environments, not in the people. So their job should have been what's not working for Janine instead of what's not working in Janine. Yes, yes. That's such a powerful mind shift. And you, you share about that a lot in the book. And I think it's so important to continue to emphasize, and it's even come up in the chat here already, is that UDL really is this mindset, this shift in thinking about barriers and really focusing on the strengths and opportunities that are there to get um, to get to the goal. And you note that it's a journey and mm -hmm. it's a journey to empathy. I think you use that word a lot in the book and I wanna highlight and kind of call out the importance of 
understanding the individuals in your organization, understanding, for example, your wife and what mm -hmm. worked well and valuing, yes, as someone just noted in the chat, the individual, uh, the individuality of everyone finding their strengths, um, which is a really exciting way of looking at and approaching professional learning in any context. So in this book, you do get a lot of strategies and we're going to outline a few of them here, but we really, there are so many here. And as James noted at the very beginning, uh, there's a lot of research on the brain and learning. So I think you, you deepen your understanding of learning, but then you get to so many practical strategies. So as we think about starting to take first steps in this journey, and I do want to appreciate and note how you describe it as a journey, that it's not something you're just ever going to say, hey, I'm done. I'm done as a parent. I'm done as a spouse. I'm done as a chef. I'm mm -hmm. done with UDL. No, no um, mic so drop moments. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so what are, I guess, what are some of the action steps that you recommend folks starting to think about that they could take action on in their work? Yeah, I, there, what was different for this book in, in, in earlier iterations, we put a lot of the, the really concrete strategies outside of examples here or there in the appendix, because my focus was like, how do I change the way that people or firm the way that people think about what learning and development should look like at work. And then once you have the right mindsets and the conceptual understanding, then you can think about, okay, you can be intentional about those, those, those tactics that you use, right? What are the overall strategy? And then I can pick my tactics rather than, oh, you just, I do all these things and that makes it universally designed. So, you know, there are things about how in, in a setting like this, using a caption, right? You've got a handouts, right? You've this is being recorded so people can go back and watch it. And we can do those things in 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 meetings and and other things in the workplace. But before we do all that, the things I really I have a whole chapter called align your mind. And it's about for the first idea of empathy and you know what is it like for another person. And we can't just I was guilty many times as an educator, especially early in my career, for designing a lesson with thinking there was going to be like, you know, 20 little Jimmies in my classroom. And since I would have loved that as a as a student, all of them would love it. And then they they did not love it. <laughs> James and I didn't know you go by Jimmy sometimes. Too. Yeah, I did. Well, back in elementary school, I did. Yeah, okay, so now was, you're the grown-up James. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, when, and when everyone what didn't want to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was a transition anyway. of joining, joining the service. But um, okay. the one thing about uh, empathy, you got to know your people, and so and know not just about them, but what it's like where they're operating and understanding what you're asking of them when you're asking them to, to learn and do a new thing or in a, in a different way. So I talk about first, go and see, go, see what it is like where folks are. I had a colleague who was um, senior vice president of learning development at Panera, and they had heavily invested in a wonderful learning management system, and they had all these modules and it wasn't quite hitting what they wanted. And he went out into the field and went to a variety of places. And what he saw was more often than not, the place where the people were accessing this learning management system was on an old terminal next to an oven in a noisy kitchen. No barrier there. <laughs> to try to like take on new stuff, right? And so that shifted, they took the new ways to deliver the same content, to space it out, to make it easier for people to learn. They put it on tablets so people could take a break and take it with them and a variety of other things that they did. But it was understanding what it was like to learn in the environment where people were doing it. Um, another thing is, is ask and listen. So tell us, what's it like for you? What is hard? You know, what is challenging? Why is this interesting, right? And then really listen and see, okay, what can I do about that? How does that inform my process? And, and you know, the, the last thing I say is, is like, try it yourself, you know, to the extent that you can, especially depending on your level of familiarity of what the task is, try it out for yourself. What questions come up for you? How scary is it for you to try this new thing? I, I tell that with, in the education sector with administrators, why don't you try universally designing your staff meeting and then see 
how scary that is for you and develop some empathy of what you're now asking of teachers and how much psychological safety you're going to need to provide and how much grace and space for trying new things. So empathy is huge. The next one is expectations, which is informed by empathy, but having high expectations for all folks. How do you have really have high expectations? There's a lot of information about research around how those expectations translate into performance. Because if I think you can learn, I'm much more likely to do the things with intention and fidelity that help you learn. And if I don't, I don't because what's the point, right? So really having those high expectations and communicating those expectations. I believe in you. I believe everybody here can learn. I'm here to listen to everybody. 3M's uh, former president used to say, I'll listen to anybody with an idea, which says the expectation is I think anybody in here can be creative. That's why 3M has over 100,000 patents, because it's not bottlenecked with a few people that are the only ones with ideas. And communicating those, in, those expectations and reinforcing those expectations and showing, you know, hey, we thought this could happen. Look, look at the good things that happened and look at your role in that, right? So really think about your expectations of people. Do you believe everybody can learn? And if not, why? What, what do you need to do, right? And then finally, ownership. And ownership is scary uh, for folks because as educators, as trainers, as managers, it is, it is a lot easier to take credit uh, ownership of the successes of the team or the class or the, or the group rather than the struggles, right? Suddenly that, well, that's on them. And I talk about even though the barriers is, exist in the environments, not the people. So how do you take ownership of the environment that allows people to be successful? How do you work with these folks in your empathy idiot, empathy interviews or, or whatever you're doing to become a barrier, to help identify barriers and become their barrier busting ally? That sounds hard. Let's figure out a way to get around that so you get to where we both want you to go. And then it's sometimes easy for professional learning providers to say, well, I do the training part. I'm not there to do the coaching or the reinforcement piece, or I'm not there all the time. True, but what you can't control, you can influence. So who is there that does the coaching? The managers, how do you, how do you build a partnership with the managers? You know, in education, where I think the principals, the assistant principals, whoever, right? How do you build partnership with them? How do you give them what they need in, in learning and mindset shifts and tools that allow them to do the effective coaching? Because the coaching still has to happen. How do you help the, the people find the information just in time that they need. Yeah, you can't be there all the time, but what can you introduce or enhance in that environment that allows them just in time support because they need that. So it's owning that whole piece, right? But with that ownership and those expectations, you have to have the expectation that you're not gonna fix the environment overnight or once and for all. It's going to be a continuous evolution. But the more that you partner with people and build our, our collective expectations for growth, the better you're going to do. And you know, you did this with the book. You describe in the book how you actually empathized. And I will say from my experience with your content, the expectations are high for anyone reading the book. It's not like, well, here are some expectations if you, and then, you know, shifting the expectations and the partnership that we, we really are working together on this. Do you want to speak any more about that empathy that you did when you were gathering feedback about the actual content of the book? Because I appreciate so much that you model in the book, the processes that you're describing for professional learning. It's fabulous the way you do that. Thank you. No, I, you know, I had my own experience as a consumer of professional learning and as a designer and deliverer of professional learning, but it was talking to other people about their experiences. So I talked to people in a variety of different uh, organizations and industries and at different levels. So yes, I talked to that senior vice president at Panera, but I also talked to you know, instructional designers. You know, some of whom work on a team of instructional des designers e doing a lot of e-learning. Other ones who are like, I wear all the hats. I do the I do the e-learning and I do the training and I do some coaching and they're sort of a one-stop shop. 
and talking to them about what is it like for you? What is hard? What do you wish other people understood about what it is, what you do? And what are your thoughts about learning at work? I talk to other people in the UDL sphere, like Kasia Dabrzewska, uh, I hope we pronounced that right, um, who wrote a you know, fantastic book from CAS Publishing called Supercharger Professional Learning. But she has taken this and applied it in, in smaller, small businesses. You know, uh, how do they improve their services to folks? And what was the thinking there? And, and how did that resonate? So sometimes it was folks that had a familiarity with universal design for learning, sometimes not. But it was really, you know, thinking about um, all these different aspects and what we should think about. I talked to professors in master's programs who teach budding instructional designers and learning facilitators who talk about UDL in their courses. We're like, well, what do you teach them there? And what do you think is important? And how does this look to you in practice? Well, and the thing that I also appreciate about this book, so for those of you um, in this webinar here, um, is that you don't have to have a, a UDL background to approach this book. You do some really, I think, important um, analogies and stories, and even the way you describe a triangle for thinking about learning with emotion and st strategies and an intellectual piece. It aligns so fluidly with the UDL guidelines so that you have this really nice on-ramp to the UDL guidelines, which I know can be overwhelming. There is a lot in there. As you said, you can, you can find just about every learning theory in the UDL guidelines, which can be a lot to think about taking on. So thinking about it in simple ways, like your, your pyramid of emotion strategy and the intellectual piece and recognizing the impermanence of memory, for example. So how we can make sure that we're scaffolding those memory systems. I think, again, you've done a really nice job um, empathizing with your readers, but holding those high expectations and then providing those tools um, to really allow folks to have that that ownership um, over the over their learning themselves. And I really do appreciate the just in time support because you you describe in the book how important learning is when you're on the job, you know, not just going off somewhere for for professional learning that's someplace else and decontextualized. And so a lot of, as you mentioned, the, the tools and the resources at the end, hopefully will provide folks with that just-in-time support. So when you need it, there is something there for you. So um, you can use all of that really flexibly, hopefully. Um, and then one of the pieces, one of my, my favorite pieces to get to ask um, authors when they come on these webinars is something that's behind the scenes. So there's something that you said um, in your book that says, and I, and I chuckled out loud and, and you kind of echoed it in some of our planning calls, but you said, I'm not going to lie, writing this book has been a lot of work, <laughs> which I just appreciate so much. It is a labor of love, but it's something that you feel so passionately about and your passion comes out as you're sharing stories. Um, and even um, it, as you're sharing them verbally, but even as you were describing, like I have this image of you and I'll call you Jimmy now because you were young, but <laughs> of your desk when you were in, I want to say first grade and you described oh. the mess that was coming out of your desk and how all of a sudden the teacher didn't want to own responsibility for that piece of Jimmy, but there were other strengths that the teacher then wanted to be like, you know, almost taking some credit for. Yeah. Um, and so, so behind the scenes a little bit. So this, this book was a lot of work. It was a labor of love. It's something you're passionate it about what are some behind the scenes stories from your writing or from the process that um, no one may know from reading the book, but um, but something you can share with us here. Well, there's a, a few things. Um, yeah, I, I call it the, the Tolkien approach to writing because J.R.L. Tolkien was famous for getting so far in a draft and then going all the way back to the beginning and then getting a little further, like the tide coming in. But you know, it, it was a, it was a process. It was years of trying to find what the book should be, trying to really nail down who the audience is. You know, in in a way that it's focused, but without, without being overly exclusive, right? So there would be a varied applicability, and and thinking about even in the process of finding the right readers. You know, that could give feedback on the book with understanding. Well, this is not one of the traditional cast books that are that's. UDL focused on the education space, this is a different space. And I think that, you know, for some of the early readers, it, it was it was a, a bridge too far to think about putting all the uh, tactics in the appendix, because for that, that, that was the translation, well, what's different between what I already know? Well, you're not the audience. 
the experience or people in a different space that probably have not even heard about this stuff. So that was that was a road. And, and my wonderful editor, Billy Fitzpatrick, she used to joke, we'd be on a call and she'd say, is your wife around? I'd say, no. she's like, okay, so someday when you do your second book, because the rule of like, we don't talk about another book in the McKenna house. <laughs> Mom had to hold forward at a lot of birthday parties and barbecues and stuff where daddy didn't go because daddy had to write. Um, I think the the challenges come or, or the, the the continued learning from writing the book is the always the evolution of how to communicate, as you said, some really complicated stuff in ways that oversimplify, but simplify enough so that it's accessible to people. Yeah, we talk about the learning triangle. I've since started talking about expert learning, you know, abridging the idea of purposeful and motivated, you know, et cetera, et cetera, into someone who has the will and the skill to learn and continuously improve, which is easier for people in, a, in an elevator pitch or just a, a quick one-off conversation, what's this about? So they understand, oh, that makes sense to me. Um, I, you know, and I'm, I'm so glad, I think it was peace that put in what the OEC, OECD stands for, but that's raised a conversation in a greater business world around what we call the skills gap. And so this skills gap, you know, uh, how much people are going to have to change. And I say, well, expert learning is the skill to close the skills gap. So that's really been a, a continuous evolution. Uh, uh, real quickly, I see, Daryl, you put the, the learning triangle. Basically, if we think about UDL with the principles of why, what, and how, I think about that as a triangle, and it comes from an analogy. When I was in the U.S. Navy, we learned about fire, and we learned about the, the necessary elements of fire, that it needs oxygen, heat, and fuel. And without any one of those, fire doesn't happen. And if you take one away, it's not a triangle anymore, and it's not a fire anymore. And for learning, it's the same thing. Without a, without a continued why, what, and how, and, and, and removing the barriers to those, we don't get continued learning, right? It's either hindered or it's completely stopped. We lose the why, or we lose our connection to what. We're, we're overloaded or confused, or we don't know what to do with it. We don't get learning. So that's the learning triangle. But yeah, that's another analogy that I use to try to take this. Because if you give people the guidelines, in the midst of a 60 minute presentation, that's a lot. So how do we get enough to get people interested to then get a book or go to cast or, or, or join a community to learn more about universal design for learning? And I've and also know, that- go, uh, Keep going. Well, and this has been helpful. Like it, this is a, this learning how to talk to people about this and communicate is a continuous journey for me. And uh, so I went, the book came out in, in late January. Uh, a few weeks later, I was at a very large learning and development conference in Florida. And it was my first time presenting on this content to a non-education audience. And I had the great fortune or the, the, the compliment that um, the day's keynote speaker, the eminent Temple Grandin, came into my session. So, you know, I was already nervous. It was 12.59 and in walks Temple Grandin and she sits down and I'm like, well, no pressure, but wow, what a compliment. Well, 15 minutes in, can you get more concrete? This is way too abstract for me. And if anybody knows Temple Grandin, Temple Grandin is brilliant, doesn't have much of a filter. It's very direct. And so we entered into a dialogue and it made me think about first this an instant like emotional look. Why is this person doing it to me? But this sign I have in my office here, it says good. And it comes from a, a book I talk about in my book uh, by Jocko Willink. Um, and the, the idea of good is that when something goes wrong, something's unanticipated, what is the good that you can make out of it? What can you learn from it? How can you improve? And so keynote speaker takes a wrecking ball to your session, good. It's an opportunity in the moment to, to practice grace and flexibility under pressure. And it's also a way of really pressure testing. How could you get this presentation? How could you do a better job? How could you get concrete faster? Understanding that it looks like you've asked too much of your audience. And you, I may have asked too much of many members of the audience. She's the only one who did me the favor of telling me in the moment. Yeah. 
but it's so you again I, use the empathy. So you were yes, understanding yeah. your audience even more. And I think you did. There's a line that I jotted down that I really liked um, because I think it does summarize UDL in a way I haven't heard UDL summarized before. And it's very short and very simple. And it's, we should never hold an expectation we don't intend to support. And I yes. love that. I really thought that's such a great, I, I remember someone from one of the departments of education saying one time, wow, we sure do ask a lot of our educators. I never thought about whether we provided the resources to meet the demands. It was um, involved in that UDL checkpoint, make sure that you have resources to support the demands, a very Vygotsky kind of approach. And just asking yourself, if you are going to have um, some kind of expectation, what is there for the support? And, and that's a great moment of having a concrete way of being able to understand it, as well as, some of the deeper theory for someone who might want to be able to delve into that, the variability like you keep coming back to, I think is um, very important and so helpful for thinking about. Yeah, I think really people need to, you know, learners, whether students or, or workers, should feel that the person that, you know, is ostensibly charged with their improvement are their partners. Like I'm invested in your success. Your success is our success. We have a common interest. We have a common goal and we're going to work together. I can't learn for you, but I can do as much as I can to put you in the best position you know, emotionally and intellectually and strategically for you to learn and improve. And then we all win. I never liked this idea like you can only have this many A's in a class and you can only have this many B's. Like if we're doing our job, we raise everybody up so that they can become their best selves, right? And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. never, never set an expectation you don't expect to support because otherwise people are like, well, then you're not invested in me and you're setting me up for failure, right? And you emphasize the engagement so much, those emotional barriers that limit autonomy, they limit participation, they did, you know, they, they limit productivity. Um, and I think it, I, I appreciate the continued focus on that. I think actually one of the examples from the nuclear power point school, um, which when I'm thinking about nuclear power plants, I wanna make sure professional learning is robust and folks are learning what they need to learn about the nuclear mm -hmm. power facility as those improvements continue to get made and updates to the system. Let's make sure learning's happening there. And this whole idea that there's a high failure rate um, and if there were no supports, there were no uh, tutors. And if you didn't pass, then I'm sorry, you're out. It just, it, it again, did not seem to be willing to support the learning and to recognize barriers are in that environment, in that ecosystem, as you're describing, to really get to the high expectations that we have in our in our different industries. Um, yeah, so uh, thank uh, you I will that. say that that was my experience, you know, decades ago. So I've hoped it's improved. But yeah, the, a lot of the things that that were modeled there are things that you see in schools too. But it's we we see it all the time, and even in, in uh, interviews with some of, some of the folks I talked to, it was. Well, I train them. They're supposed to just go do it. What if they can't just go do it? Yeah, and I do want to um, give everyone an opportunity here to ask any questions that you may have from the conversation that we've been having. Contribute to those. There's been quite a lot of conversation going on in the chat. So I do want to make sure we pause for a moment to give a chance and a breath for some of those questions, some of those comments. Um, there's a note in here about uh, John Hattie's work too, the use of performance indicators and his focus on evaluation in education, directly speaking to the differences between the point of learning versus the point of teaching, mm -hmm. which is interesting. So thank you for that comment. Well, yes, Elena, destroy that bell curve, right? <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a badge of honor. I failed this many kids. And I do want to point out, so David Gordon shared, um, this was something that we were hoping to, to share here, that you had an article recently also published in the Harvard Business Review. So can you share a little bit about that article with us? Oh, yeah, that, that was a uh, that was a proud moment. We got, uh, I, I was at home and I got the email that, you know, they were interested in having an article. And my children were just looking at me bewildered as I held my phone. I was like, yeah my son and football news was on and my son was like did you win fantasy football dad <laughs> nobody season's over daddy daddy got asked to write something for the harvard business review 
but yeah, there was the you know the Toby Lester was the senior editor there, got a copy of the book thanks to David, and and thought about well you know there's some content in here that would be valuable, and so we wrote um, I wrote a piece about about expert learning at work, making the argument you know that we've got this gap, we have to help people improve. And there's, I, I mentioned another, there's a, another gentleman and his name is, escapes me, he wrote a great article about, um, we have to stop with this, everybody owns their own improvement because we don't all show up. If we think about equity, we don't all show up with the same skill set, the same experiences, right? How do I own my own improvement if you don't give me time to learn? How do I own my own improvement if, you're giving me materials at a 12th grade level and I showed up to work with a fifth grade reading level, which is like half the country, right? So how am I supposed to own my own improvement? Whereas, you know, and I this book is about how do we partner so we collectively own the improvement of folks. There's still, you know, people have a responsibility, but they have to be empowered for themselves to improve. I like to say learning is something that should be done by people, not to them. Right. And so the, the Harvard Business Review piece was was a great opportunity to just get some eyeballs on this concept, especially outside of the learning and development space where so far we've had the most traction, because it's it's not a lot of times just to, uh, many times with certain educators. Those aren't the folks that you have to convince. It's the those that are, you know, sometimes perceptually ancillary to the learning process that need the understanding of like, well, it's actually our collective responsibility for everybody to improve. And we all have something that we can contribute to and we can all be barrier busters, right? And so speaking to managers and leaders about how they perceive learning and its value was a great opportunity. Fabulous. And I know, as you say, deep, meaningful learning can be hard. So really getting at, all right, then let's design for it. Let's support it. Let's scaffold it. And time is such a critical, important one. And there's kind of a plus one for that comment here, really thinking about how educators don't have time in the work week, in the work week often for their mm -hmm. own professional learning. Um, so really valuing that time that if the learning is a goal and that improvement is a goal, then we need to create those conditions under which the variability of our workers and our learners Learners um, can really um, can really make that happen. Um, here's a question. Here I'm presenting in front of a bunch of leaders in my school district from various roles: finance, HR, IT, on why we all need to see ourselves through the lens of UDL. If you could say one thing to them, what would it be? Why is it important for all to see them in this work? Well, that's a hard one. A lot of Although times, she's saying maybe you just answered right. it, but I would <laughs> like a, a one off. I, I a lot of times with folks from different jobs, I put them through some experiences. So I think of like, well, why did I like that? Why did that resonate with me? Why wouldn't I want that for somebody else? And how can I make that happen? But I would say that when we think about, you know, there are a lot of definitions around inclusion, but I would say in a presentation like that, an inclusive environment would be where I show up and I feel like. Somebody thought about someone like me, however I'm showing up that day, when they put this together, that what makes me different mattered enough to them to allow some flexibility um, in what they're doing so that makes space for me to be my best self. And allowing them to resonate on that and, and think about you know, how they can do that for other people and what they prefer, it may not be what's best for everybody, you know, and experience some of those things, I think is a good way to start shifting mindset. Sometimes you have to get the people to experience or behave into a way of, a new way of thinking mm -hmm. by asking them to try new things. I will say, if you want a quick one about for empathy, this only works, uh, this one works only for people that don't have um, motor issues, unless you, you can come up with a scaffold or, or, or a modification. I got this from a guy named Doug Lip who work, used to work at Disney. And say, you take your dominant hand and in a writing utensil and sign your name. And then rate that, that signature on your own subjective one to 10 scale. Like one, I can't read it. 10 is like John Hancock, whatever that scale is. Then switch hands, do it again, and use the same scale to rate yourself. You don't have to show anybody. 
you just know that. And what I do, when I do that, I observe like how many people it took them longer, how much laughing happened. So some of that, oh, and, and that builds a little empathy. What is it like to try something new? It's a little scary. It takes a little longer. You have to think a little bit more about it. And there's a worry that it won't be as good as what I usually do. So how do I'm brave enough to not default to what I usually do? So that would be another thing I would I would have people try just to trigger a little bit of that empathy around trying new things. So good. And you do share an example that a participant from one of your trainings one time pulled you aside and said, you know, this is the first training like this where I've been able to use everything. And you asked a little bit more and she said, well, I have a visual impairment and being able to zoom in, to listen, to use the accessibility tools in my browser to explore all the materials has been amazing. And you were surprised because she was an active participant, contributing to conversations, making small talk during breaks. Never once did um, she ask about accessibility. And you said, I had no idea you had a visual impairment. And she said, yeah, that's the point. I didn't need to tell you because everything worked for me. And I can't tell you how like at this point in your book, I just was cheering because that's how we, that's how to get to this quote that someone shared that we built this with you in mind. You didn't know this woman, but you designed in a way so people could come as they were with all of their amazing variability and fully engage, participate, uh, strategize, um, be intellectual to get to some of the words that we've shared mm -hmm. during this conversation. And if they didn't, you worked to make sure that you could learn from them as you shared from your Temple Grandin example, and then continue to iterate and improve and move, um, move the scale so that you were designing for all of the individuals in that learning space. So there are so many amazing little stories and anecdotes like this in James's book. And we have up here for you all a code that you can use from castpublishing.org. You can save 30% with the code ThriveWeb23. So T H R I V E W E B 23, all caps, all one word. During the checkout, you can use that through July 31st, 2023. And we really, I, I cannot recommend this book enough. It's for any learner anywhere. So in schools, out of schools, um, there, there are examples that I think you'll find meaningful here. And there's a lot that goes on at CAST. So we also want to make sure that you keep in touch with us at CAST. We have a CAST newsletter that has a lot of our events that are going on, a lot of professional learning, some uh, research and development, CAST professional publishing, just you can get the latest from CAST bit.ly slash cast dash newsletter. So all lowercase bit dot ly slash cast dash newsletter. So please keep in touch with us through cast. And I would like to um, end with a, with a couple final notes. So first of all, we value your feedback. Just like James described, we want to empathize with you. This was a learning moment here during this webinar. So please let us know what worked well for you. Where were their barriers and how can we design together to make sure that we continue to build and grow our webinars to be the best experience that they can be for your professional learning. And I do want to also share that you had a quote in here that I grew up in Florida and not too far from Disney World. And you said uh, at one point, if you can dream it, you can do it, that you will never be done with design and you have to be okay with that. All great pursuits are like this. You get a little better every day in every interaction with every decision. So I want to thank you for that takeaway. That was that was something that really, if you can dream it, you can do it. And let's take those steps to it. So wherever you all are in your work, in the world, we appreciate you being here with us today. And we hope that you're able to start taking those steps in every interaction. And, and James, I'll just turn it over to you to see, do you have any last comments or thoughts before we close up for the day? No, uh, if you dream it, you can do it is yet another sign in my office. It's just, oh, it is. Like the <laughs> and, and you can see it, it's, uh, uh, yeah, it's right up there. Oh, that's excellent, <laughs> that's excellent. But, There's a little know, bit more behind the scenes, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just I'm thrilled to be part of this conversation. I'm glad to see this spreading, you know, when I said be, be on the classroom. So yeah, workplace learning happens in education and more of us who are working within in the education sphere should think about how can we more universally design our systems. I mean, it's great work that that uh, Katie Novak and, and Kristen Rodriguez did around universally designed leadership and, and, and really thinking about those things, but then expanding it beyond to the greater learning and development because 
these are the organizations that many of our students, you know, that we hope are developed as expert learners are going to go join. And so how do they land in a place that creates the context for them to operate in the ways that we hopefully have, you know, helped them become? Amazing. Well, those are fabulous last words. So I will, <laughs> I will let everyone reflect on that. Thank you all for joining us today. We're so appreciative of you taking time, whether it's face-to-face -face or um, if you're watching the recording later. Thanks again to our captioner and our team, Mindy Johnson and Nathan Trites, who help put all of this together. Um, so James, thank you again for being here. Everyone have a great day or evening, wherever you are in the time zones. <laughs>